Welcome, Feel Good Fathers. I'm really delighted today. It's going to be a fun conversation. I'm joined by Barry Adkins. He's got a book, Kevin's Last Walk, uh, a book, and also you can find him on Facebook, Kevin's Last Walk, exactly as it sounds. So Kevin S. Last Walk is how you would spell that. Uh, This is interesting. So it's Barry talking about Kevin. There's some light research. Barry, why don't you tell us a little bit about your story and welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me on, Jay. So uh, I'll tell the high level of the story. Uh, My son, 18-year-old son, Kevin, died of alcohol poisoning on the day he moved out on his own. Wow. In an effort to raise awareness about what happened to him, I put his ashes in my backpack and walked from Gilbert, Arizona to Kalispell, Montana, and told the story along the way not to raise money, but to tell the story, because I guarantee you, you don't want to go through this. Sure. Um, and, and 100%, no father wants to go through that. So what, why don't you tell us some, like the high level of what the story was, is what the story happened and what's important here. And then we'll get into sort of our talking points for today. So I'll pick it up uh, where he graduated from high school. I remember going to his high school graduation ceremony and he gave me a hug and whispered, thanks for not giving up on me, dad. Mm. Uh, He got a job right out of high school making good money. Uh, He met my financial requirements, so I agreed to co-sign a loan because he wanted to buy a new truck, right? And for you fathers, I made him give me three months worth of insurance payments and car payments before I co-signed that loan. And I was hoping that he would find a truck from a private party. I'd go down to the credit union, sign papers, and be out of there in five minutes. He found one at a dealership. Mm. Those of you who work at the dealership, I apologize, but that process can be painful, as you well know, Jay. Um, and I go down to sign papers, sit down in the financial guy's office. First thing that guy said to me was, how about some life insurance? Hmm. I'm that guy. I'm like, I had told him, I don't need life insurance. And he said, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking right. about your son. And I'm that guy that told him, 18 uh, year old boys don't need life insurance. They don't die. Right. But I was wrong. They do die. He wouldn't live long enough to make a single payment on that truck. Yeah. And so a couple of weeks later, he decided to move out. Uh, I remember him throwing a bed, a TV and a dresser in the back of his truck. He came back in, went into his bedroom and I'm sure none of nobody else's kids have this clothing system, but he has clean wrinkled clothes on the floor, dirty clothes right next to it. He throws a pair of the clean jeans in the dryer to de-wrinkle, came back in the living room and told me something I've never forgotten. He wasn't going to take his toothbrush with him. He'd be back tomorrow and get it. Hmm. I walked out from with him like I normally do, gave him a hug, told him that I loved him and to be careful, and watched him drive away. It was the last time I saw him alive. That night, his buddies decided to throw a housewarming party for him. Started with a keg of beer, moved on to shots. He passed out sometime after midnight. Uh, the people at the party threw his Threw him in his bed on his side in case he vomited, right? Because he's just passed out. And they actually went in and shaved his head and his legs while he was passed out. But his buddy Craig was worried about him and kept going back in to check on him. Around 4 a.m., calls started coming in to 911. First calls were difficulty breathing. Next calls were not breathing. My son died alone in a hospital while I slept peacefully in my bed. That's real rough. Um, That's real rough. So uh, let's talk about, let's kind of move on to kind of the four topics, right? We've got decision-making, adversity, forgiveness, and then grief. So walk us through uh, decision-making and what's that about? So decision-making here's the thing. We all need to make decisions in our life, but the two most important decisions that you or your children are ever going to make 
are about drugs and alcohol. It isn't even close. We all know stories. You know stories. I know stories. The audience knows stories. You need to educate yourselves about the dangers of drug and alcohol abuse as if your life depends upon it. Because it does. It just does. Right? Um, I know we always think about going to school and, you know, what kind of car are we going to buy and blah, 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 where are we going to live? But those decisions are really minor in comparison to those two. What are the... What are the criteria and what are the uh, piece of information that a father, a feel good father should consider when talking to their sons and daughters about drug and alcohol, drug, drug and alcohol? This is a, that's a, that's a good question. That, that this is a tricky topic, right? Um, Cause people are probably wondering, did I talk to Kevin about alcohol and drugs? I talked to him about drugs a lot. I didn't talk to him about alcohol because we have an alcoholic in the family and Kevin knew very well how destructive it was. And he always talked about how stupid he was for doing that. So I did not talk to him about it. And the best advice I can give people, because people always ask, you know, when should I start doing that? There's one thing I know for sure. Don't wait until it's too late, man. Don't wait until it's too late. Got it. Okay. Um, let's have a conversation about adversity. What's that? What's that about? The way you respond to adversity is going to define your life. Notice I didn't say might. It will. Bad stuff happens to everybody. As much as we don't want bad stuff to happen to our kids, it will. The way you handle it is going to define your life. Pain is fertile ground for radical change. Don't waste that pain, man. Don't waste the pain. So how would, um, how did you... Uh, how did you use this adversity to change your life? So in the beginning, obviously, when Kevin passed away, um, I was a lost soul. I was a lost soul that simply didn't understand why the world was still turning, right? I guess that's the best way you can describe it. You don't know why people are still going to work and cars are driving by and that kind of stuff. Um, and I was angry with God. Plain and simple. I had conversations with him, you know, hey, back up time, take me. Let him live. A couple days later, I had another life-changing event. I was laying in bed. It was about four o'clock in the morning when I just felt like somebody walked in the room. There was a light, a light I'd never seen before and haven't seen since. The message was very simple. Kevin didn't suffer and something very good would come from this. What that something very good is, I don't know. Why God chose me for that message, I I don't know. As as the saying goes in the Bible, uh, God doesn't choose the qualified; He qualifies the chosen. You and I certainly wasn't qualified, but here I am, seventeen years later, still telling the story. What kind of, uh, when we began, you, you mentioned going on this huge, it was like 1700 mile walk or something like that. And this, this hike, what kind of impact did you see, um, on the road when you were telling the story? I could talk for about an hour about the walk and all of the nuances. It was just, was a, it was a cool, I look back on it, Jay, and think, man, how did I, how did I pull that off? But you meet a lot of wonderful people along the way. Um, everybody's got a story, right? Um, 
there's a couple of specific examples, but the one that uh, I remember the best was, so I walked from Gilbert, Arizona to Kalispell, Montana with his ashes in my backpack. It's about 1,400 miles. Uh, and in Flagstaff, I spoke at a high school. And probably three or four days later, uh, I was walking towards Page, Arizona. And uh, there's a lot of people always stopped and talked to me. And I saw a car pull over and I thought, oh, cool. I'll take a break, chat with this person. And the guy comes up and he said, are you the guy that spoke at Flagstaff High School a couple of days ago? I said, well, yeah, I was there. And he said, well, my son was there. And he came home and actually talked to me about it. And that's the first time he has ever done it. And I thank you for that. That's good. That's, yeah. I mean, that's a really good reaction. You know, like, yeah. I think you know, you're saying like, Hey, what's making something good come out of it. You know, this, that yeah. sounds exactly like the kind of reaction you'd want. Right. Yeah. Okay. And there's been good stuff. I mean, people, I had ladies bring me brownies and milk when I'm out there walking and, uh, you know, Hey, you need a ride. I probably got to ask that every day for sure. And if it was raining, every car that went by stopped and asked if I wanted a ride. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, so what was it like for you? Like, what was the process that you went through? What was going through your head? How did, you know, how did that lead to your healing that moment, those 1400 miles? The 1400 miles was all about forgiveness. Um, you know, that's really, uh, a lot of what I wanted to do, right? Because as a parent, um, it was easy for me to forgive the guys at the party because this was Kevin's choice, right? And it was easy for me to forgive my kid because that's what parents do. But there's one person that was really hard to forgive. And that was me. Hmm. And that's what it was. It was a 1400 mile journey to forgive myself. I, the one thing, um, I did not, uh, wear any headphones. I didn't listen to music. I just wanted to let my mind go where it needs to go. And, and in today's society, um, people don't do that enough. It's good to be quiet and just let your mind go where it needs to go. Right. hundred percent. Uh, where did it go yeah. for you? You know, memories. Uh, I actually, um, we hiked uh, Pariah Canyon. People can look it up. Uh, it's in northern Arizona. It's a slot canyon. I walked right by that place, which brought back a lot of memories. Uh, it was a lot about remembering little things. Because uh, it's interesting, uh, when he first passed away, you remember a lot of things. But as time goes on, it takes some something to happen to remind you of those things or a picture or something. But it, it was a lot about just remembering them. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, what, so what would you tell, say a feel good father that's going through some sort of grief, you know, like what, what should they do in, in that, in those moments? So, Grief is a really tricky topic, um, and and for the fathers out there that are going through that, keep in mind that this is roughly 19 years in the rearview mirror for me. Um, but the one thing I will tell you, and this is a little bit hard for people to accept, is uh, you're never going to feel the way you did before your kid died. You can't as much as you want to, and I wanted to, and I tried, and I tried, and I tried. And I realized at some point, you can't go back. The old you is as gone as that person. There's a new you there. There's a new you there that is going to go on one of two paths, right? You can be a better you, or in sadly, in a lot of cases, it destroys lives but that's your call. But the old you is gone. You can't get back to that point. 
That's okay. So you brought up something interesting here. You said destroys lives and there's another path and there's a choice. So what would be a way that a feel good father would move through that and make, make a choice? What are the kind of choices that would be in front of them? Again, I go back to something very good will come from this. The most you can hope for when something bad happens to you is to make something good come from it. And there's a lot of examples of parents doing wonderful things out there. And for me, that's I'm sure that's what your loved one would want you to do is make something good come from it. What is that something very good? I still don't know what mine is, right? But I plan on chasing it. And it gives you a mission, right? It gives you something. Go make it happen. However you make it happen, make it happen. So what are you doing right now? Like what, what does the mission look like? The mission is to get out and tell the story. Because the other dirty little secret here is that money won't fix the hurt. There's no money in the world that'll fix the hurt. The only thing that helps is to try to make something good come from this. And that's why I still, uh, I just spoke, uh, at, I speak at Mothers Against Drunk Driving as a victim impact panels, which I don't like the word victim at all. We can talk about that in a minute. But um, and one of the things I tell people at the beginning is, I don't want you to listen here. I want you to listen here. And uh, as I walked away, this lady came up and gave me a hug and she said, I listened with my heart and I'll never forget it. What's the, so for those that are listening, your, uh, the, the pantomime was, uh, don't listen with your head, but listen with your heart instead. Yes. And so yes. what's an example? So this is really great. So, uh, you know, and in any given week, you might be listening to your pastor, your priest at a pulpit, you could be listening to a boss or something like that. And so let's say you're in, let's say you're in that faith-based world. Let's say you're at church or something like that, and you're listening uh, how do you listen? What's an example of listening with your head and what's an example of listening with your heart? Ooh. I think it's about letting go. I think it's about letting go and listening to what is being said. And, and this is the tricky part about, uh, being a preacher is, uh, leaving gaps so that you can digest what you've just been told. Uh, and I, I kind of focus on pausing because in order to listen with your heart, you need, there needs to be pauses to think about what was just said before the next thing comes up. And the other interesting thing for me along those lines that I discovered is that, uh, before this happened, uh, I was a Christian, but um, I didn't know how relevant the Bible really was. But these three things, uh, adversity and forgiveness and decision-making, are smeared all over in the Bible. Yeah. Uh, th 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 these things are not new things, and they're important things. And I... I I can't overemphasize how important adversity and forgiveness, especially forgiveness. Um, you know, I heard a pastor describe it best once. He said that anger and vengeance lead to one thing, destruction. Forgiveness leads to healing. And sometimes the most important person you need to forgive is yourself. We all make mistakes. It's the way you handle it that matters. What is what are your favorite verses around forgiveness? Uh don't have those off the top of my head. Um, but we don't have to go any further than the Lord's Prayer, right? Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Mm -hmm. I think it's Ephesians. Get rid of all malice, bitterness, rage, and anger. Uh, I don't have it off. I, I'm not good at memorizing verses, Jay. <laughs> I have a few of them memorized. That's right. That's, 
I, it's in Ephesians. It's at the beginning. It talks about uh, getting rid of all bitterness and anger and rage and basically letting go. Yeah, that's okay. I mean, that that's good enough. That's all right. We don't all, we don't all have to be Bible scholars. You know, to, and I'm not. <laughs> to communicate it. So uh, as long as you got the intention and you know where it's about, I, I like that bitterness, anger, and rage. That sounds, those sounds like thing. Those definitely sound probably like a common, those are probably common uh, emotional texture of fathers um, and men kind of going through the world. You know, I've, I've always said that there's for the feel good father, there's two core emotions to have under control. Uh, the anger and then lust being the other one does, you know, anger and desire being the two, the two sort of emotional palettes. I like to call them the textures, you know, to, to have, have, you mentioned control. lust and I just was reading. So what I, I actually have Billy Graham's book unto the Hills, which is a devotional. Sure. And he was just talking about that. Uh, how, well, actually it's in a Psalm where they talk about, well, if you have lust, then don't drive by that woman's house. Don't don't go to that bar where you know she's going to be there because you know that's going to be a problem. You stay away from those places, right? Just like if you're an alcoholic, don't go into a bar and think you're going to sit there and drink soda all night, right? Yeah. Don't put yourself put yourself in a position to be successful. I remember uh, two really good statements about this. So a previous guest, Fred. He came, he came in, he, we had a, we had a great discussion about lust and we had a great discussion about, um, uh, anger. And he said, you can't, you can't lust over someone if they're in the corner of your eye. It's like, I can't like, it just like, you know, I'm, what I'm doing now, I'm pantomiming, like looking to the side from the camera. Right. It's like, if they're, if they're in your periphery, you're not focused exactly. on it. Same idea. Yeah. 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 That's, that's interesting. I love that. That's, that's our, that's really good. So what about <laughs> anger? Something very different. <laughs> right. So oh, I'm it's familiar with that emotion. too. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you like, what's a simple little thing there that you would, you would suggest that fathers do with anger? You have to have a way to get that out. Um, walking away is always and and the other thing about anger is that you're somehow offended by something that happened uh and this is something with age right i'm 65 i'll tell you that right now um you need to learn to get over yourself yeah yeah right uh and that's another fundamental fundamental biblical truth is it's not about you right and a lot of times you get hung up because you're offended by something. Mm. Let me help you out. People are going to offend you your whole life, right? You, If you want to take offense to things, you'll find it every day of your life. I think you know that, Jay. If you want to oh, take 100%. offense to things, uh, it's available every single day, all day, right? You just, at some point, the Bible teaches you to be humble and get over yourself. I always think of when I'm thinking in this world, thinking of assuming good intent, you know, I, yes. I always think back to Exodus, right? One of the first commands uh, through Moses from God was holding your neighbor's reputation. That was like one of the first things, like it's, you know, it's sentence two or three in the book. Right. So it, it's right in the front, you know, and you know, you leave with your best. And when you look at um, the 10 commandments, I think half of them are about how do you interface with somebody else? How do you treat somebody else? And, and most of it's like assuming good intent. Um, I like to think of it as uh, see that it, the divinity in the other person. So just assuming that they, you know, that they have goodness in them. They're made, they're also made in the image of God. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so they might be there for that. Uh, I just had an interesting, uh, so there's an, there's part of this, um, this anger thing. Cause sometimes when somebody says something, you're angry and, it might be because they're right. Yes. And I had a guy one time, this has been several years ago, real young guy. He said, he, we we're talking at a get together and he said, you don't still speak at high schools, do you? And I said, 
As a matter of fact, I do. And he said, you need to stop doing that. You're too old to do that. Yeah, that was my reaction. I I did not like it. But with a little bit of time, and I was upset with him. I'm like, dude, okay, whatever. I walked away. But I thought about it a little bit. And then I thought, you know, maybe I ought to address that right up front. So the first thing I do when I speak at high schools is I tell them, I'm not here to tell you how to live your life. I'm just here to tell you a story. I was angry with them, but sometimes that anger is because maybe they're right. I can totally see how... I can absolutely see how today, because I felt it, you know, I'm 20 years younger than you are. So I can totally see how when I was in high school, we were starting to reach that um, the information age was beginning. And so a lot of the, so just like the, the raw amount of information and knowledge that was available to me was just more than my generation, than my parents' generation. And I can totally see the arrogance and self-assuredness increase as that is something that all young men need to deal with is um, their own pride and ego and being open to mentorship, the wisdom of, of our elders and stuff like that. Um, so I can totally see that reaction coming out. Um, but I love the idea that, Hey, I'm just here to tell you a story in part, a little bit of wisdom. You know, and I've, I've had high school principals tell me that was the most important thing I said. <clears throat> was it, I'm not here to tell you how to live your life. What kind of reactions have you had? Because I, I think this is important. What kind of reactions have you had from high school students after your talk? I will say that um, <clears throat> the reaction is very positive. They come up and want to talk to me afterwards. But uh, for me, I've had a number of principals say, I can't believe how quiet they were. So I, I've done it in front of 2,000 high school students, and you can hear a pin drop in there when I do it. And it's <clears throat> it's just, uh, I know it's a God thing, it's not me, but it's just when they're locked in uh, like that, it's kind of a funny story. Uh, I just did this recently in Nebraska, and I had a wireless mic on, right? Hands-free wireless mic. I'm doing all my stuff. And I go over to play the – I play a short video, very short video of a voicemail he left. And so I'm standing in front of the podium, and these kids are just dead quiet, right? They are locked in. And I realize somebody's standing next to me, this guy – I'm trying to pay attention to what I'm doing. And he's replacing the battery on my wireless mic. And he goes, I don't want him. And I told him later, I said, why didn't you just come out and tell me? He goes, they were so locked in. I did not want to distract him. So he snuck in from the back behind the curtain and replaced the battery on my mic because he felt like they were that locked in that he didn't want, he did not want a single distraction. It was really interesting. I, th I think this is a really good lesson for uh, our feel good fathers to, to pay attention to in that we're living today, we're living in an age where um, there's mobile distraction, mobile addiction, social media is in the way, you know, for, for our daughters, a lot of it's going to be your social media and that kind of communication. And for a lot of our sons, it's going to be the gaming, whether it's TV game, you know, for, you know, for my generation, it was the Sega master system and the Genesis and Nintendo, <laughs> right? And Mine so was Nintendo, very different, but yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Atari or, or something else like that. Right. I grew up with an, on an eight, uh, 2600 Atari 2600, uh, Texas instruments back in the day. I played the Pong. Shows. Yep. I the Pong, Pong. Yep. The original Pong. Yeah. <laughs> was yeah. And then, you know, and nowadays it, it's so sophisticated and I think, one of the things that um, one of the things that is very true is that making it through. We we're talking about adversity, making the tough choices, and and this is a very biblical thing. It's doing the toil, 
doing the work, making that really those really good short term choices lead to that that ingrained satisfaction, fulfillment, happiness, joy um, at the end of the day. And a lot of the choices that we're and a lot of the choice that we're making in the electronic space, they're not necessarily translatable to to the real world. And it's okay. And this is not, it's not an evaluation, right? But most of the time, I think for our parents, it's a matter of, have we done enough? And I think I, I love this because it, it, it's, it's reminding me so much because I want to qualify that statement. What does it mean? Have we done enough with Chesley Lundy? Cause is his interview. And I, and I can't remember cause we did both of ours back to back. It's like, I interviewed him for feel good fatherhood. And then he interviewed me for his, for his show, mm-hmm. Chesley Lundy. And we ended up at one point talking about something called uh, didactic, uh, didactic thought. And so really what that means is that, and Barry, you brought this up earlier. We don't always take the time to digest what's being said, what information is in front of us, the choices that are available to us. And that is a, that is a developable, developable skill. It's something that you can teach and impart to your kids how to do that, how to take the time to think. Because the, here's the alternative is that let's suppose I'll, I'll use this example, right? Uh, and, and just let me know if it's uncomfortable, but yeah. let's suppose that you are, you're a son, I'm a son, you're a son, and you're at a point where you're in some sort of actual, actual fight or flight situation. Let's say maybe you're driving and all of a sudden you're under you're all, the, all of a sudden somebody's in your lane coming at you for a head-on collision or let's suppose it's an actual street fight or even worse let's suppose it's an actual battle and you're a soldier and a warrior right in those moments you're you're pretty much your brain is not going to go into reasoning it's not going to go into that slower academic reasoning, didactic thought. It's not going to be like, huh, I, I ain't going to hypothesize that that car is coming at me. I'm going to like all these weird yeah. things that are happening. Yeah. Right? It's going to say, I'm in danger. I need to react right now in order to get to not be in danger. And your lizard brain and the emotional side of your body and your physiology and your body starts to moving and um, I've even had moments of this where I had <laughs> with me and my best friend, I had something called the death turn and, uh, we were driving way too fast on the highway as young men do. And I realized I misinterpreted a sign for my exit. It was one eighth of a mile. And I thought it was one half of a mile. And so when I went to pass and then we, <laughs> and then I went to pass them and then we cut through and then my car was swerving, but my emotional brain kicked in because your emotional brain reacts faster. And I've told all this story because there are certain situations where these kind of things happen. However, this is exactly what's happened happens to us when we're on our phone all the time, or when we're on social media or playing games, or people are telling us what to do is that we can't anymore reason. We can't anymore take the time to digest what's happening we get kicked into emotional evaluation. And so that's why I really love yeah. when you were saying we need to take that pause in the beginning to evaluate what's happening. So um, I've kind of gotten on my little diatribe for a little bit, <laughs> a little discussion. I'd take love to hear breath, your thoughts yeah. on sort of the difference uh, about like when we're in it and we're doing things what are the practices? What are the things we can do to take those pauses and to really reflect on what's happening? And that's the tricky part of it, right, Jay? Um, I, the Bible teaches us to be quiet uh, over and over again. They talk about Jesus going out to be quiet. And I think having that on a daily basis somehow, it might be just when you're driving to work, uh, turn the radio off. Don't answer any texts or you don't have to answer texts when you're driving anyway, but just have that time to think. Uh, I do a fair amount of walking still, not, not, not to the extent of walking in Montana, but, um, 
I enjoy because I it's interesting when you don't have any distractions, you kind of think about things you need to get done. Right. And you'll remember, oh, that's right. I need to do this or I need to call this person back. Those random things come to you when you just let it go. Got it. So mainly taking space to walk uh, or just taking space to be quiet. I love the practice of being present. Uh, I, I remember once it was like, there's a lot of people that are saying, um, listen to a podcast while you're getting ready in the morning, do this while you're doing that. And I, I happen to ruck every day. It's one of the things that I love to do, which is I put a weighted backpack on and I just go oh. for about a 30, 35 minute walk. Yeah. And it's amazing. I don't bring my phone with me. I just go for the walk. Uh, I don't even have my watch. I just go. And sometimes I go a little bit further. Sometimes I go a little bit shorter, depending, usually it's depending on the heat. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> but, I'm in Arizona. I know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, that's fantastic. Barry, this has been a, a really interesting conversation. Um, definitely a, a, a tough topic, I think, for any father to kind of reconcile and deal with. But we have some great action items out of it. If, if folks... Uh, want to get a little bit more in touch with you. They can find you at Kevin's last walk. Is there any last comments for our feel good father audience to, to say? One last thing. Um, I'm always open to coming to other schools in other States and telling the story. Uh, I've got lots of uh, references if you need them. Uh, it just takes a personal connection. Usually somebody says, yeah, you should have this guy come in and we can usually, we can usually make it happen one way or the other. And I, that's what I want to do. Got it. Got it. All right. Barry Adkins, everybody. Thanks, Jay.